It was a time when there weren't paediatric nephrologists around because there was no UK training. Um, in 1964, as part of my pre-reg job in the Royal Infirmary in Glasgow, I did six weeks of nephrology, general nephrology. Um, in 1966, I had decided I wanted to do paediatrics, so I came back um, to Sick Children's Hospital at that time and I was on Ward 5 and the consultant on the ward was Professor Arneal. We got in a, a boy of about 10, very ill with acute glomerular nephritis, oligoanuric, rising potassium. Now before then the little boy would have been sedated and died but because I had learned how to do peritoneal dialysis in the Royal Infirmary and Adults, I did a peritoneal dialysis on the child and he recovered fully and was well. After that, I went to do my general memberships and came back and did another two year job in general nephrology in the Royal Infirmary. Came back into sick kids. Gavin appointed me his lecturer in paediatric nephrology. They weren't keen at that time for us to leave Glasgow. Um, so, I stayed in Glasgow. As the lecturer in paediatric nephrology, um, Gavin took me to the Paris meeting, European paediatric meeting. I was amazed, David, because there I saw and heard children being dialysed and transplanted. This was 1970, 69-70, I think. Um, and they were doing a dialysis and transplantation on end-stage renal disease in children in Paris and in London. So, of course, I said to Gavin, coming back in the plane, Professor O'Neill, we can't deprive the Scottish children of treatment for their chronic renal failure. Gavin, at that time we were in Oak Bank and the new hospital was getting built. Gavin was on the commissioning team. The next I knew, was that a year later, 71, Gavin had removed from the corridor a sign for a metabolic unit and replaced it as a sign for the renal unit. So we got an eight-bedded renal unit and the next year I was appointed consultant to set up a renal service for the children. Um, at the beginning it was really tough because the general nephrologists were having funding difficulties with their dialysis programs. The general paediatricians and the general surgeons had always sedated the children with chronic renal failure because no treatment was available. So uh, it was initially that unit that we concentrated on investigation. We treated acute renal failure children, hemolytic uremic syndrome, um, you know, show online. Um, and we treated them with acute perineal dialysis. The older children we did dialysis on, hemodialysis, with a coil and Scribner shunts. Um, but it took some time for chronic renal failure children to come. First one was referred from Ayrshire. But I remember one weekend when the registrar on sick children's general wards phoned me at home and said, very worried, we've got this lovely 11-year-old girl, she's got end-stage renal disease, but uh, the consultant in the ward has said no treatment available. So on a Sunday morning, I rushed into the hospital and brought this little girl down. I met her in her gang street the other day, fine, smiling knows me well. So the, the, the long term, the, the chronic dialysis, hemodialysis program started. Um, initially with Scribner shunts, then fistula. Um, and uh, things were, well, we, we, we didn't, we weren't able to dialyze, to, to transplant at that time. For the little ones, there was a a lovely little boy from one of the islands, only two and a half, and we, we put him on a chronic peritoneal dialysis programme. 
but there was no small bags available for children at that time. So this little boy used to go round the ward with a barra and a two-litre bag on it for his per chronic peritoneal dialysis. So uh, gradually, gradually, and some of the nurses here will remember those children, gradually, gradually we set up the end-stage renal disease programme. Then we got referrals from Inverness and all round. So it was clear that uh, we needed to train for home hemodialysis or home dialysis. Um, but again, we had difficulties because whereas the general nephrologists were hesitant to support our programme because they weren't getting funding for their chronic programmes enough. They weren't getting enough and they were questioning why children are getting funded. Um, but when we started the home dialysis training program, again there was questions being asked because Drupal Hospital was the main home dialysis training unit and the consultants came over to me to say could the children and families not go there. But I was determined no, our staff will train. So we, we had children going home uh, on dialysis at that time. So the other thing is that we, we had an isotope renogram session uh, weekly looking at uh, drain, children's drainage, kidneys drainage and a rough assessment of individual renal function. Um, we had regular meetings, set up regular meetings, meeting with the radiologist once a week in the morning. The surgeons came across, we had regular meetings with them. And also, uh, we were looking after the children on the International Nephrotic Syndrome Study, David. And um, so I met regularly with the pathologists to look at their biopsies. So the unit was getting busy. Um, we had in that little eight bedded unit, the two bedded unit for chronic dialysis. and. Uh, And we went, we went on um, with great help from the charity groups, especially the British Kidney Patient Association. They set up the Renal Day Unit and it had a facility for parents to stay. And that was a great thing because that helped in the uh, promotion of the home dialysis programme. Um, we transferred the dialysis, uh, child, chronic dialysis children over to the D-bed unit and that was a great help. Thereafter, uh, that would take us into the 80s um, and what happened in the 80s were developments in the service. Um, not only in our service, David, but in other services throughout the hospital, which helped a lot. For example, the paediatric intensive care service became very good. Professor Caves developed it in the light of his experience in the States. And so the post-cardiac renal uh, failure from surgery um, became quite a common uh, treatment for us to, to be involved in intensive care. Other developments, renal tract ultrasound came in stream, so we didn't need any more isotope renography. Um, the gamma camera we managed to get for the on charity for the day unit. Long lines were introduced, which were great for the small children needing dialyzed. The children got very much better when we started with the erythropoietin and. Uh, my goodness, what a difference uh, with growth hormone when it came along, because the children were all very small. Um, transplantation um, was difficult for us because I think there was a, a degree of isolation um, from the gen general nephrology units. 
uh, in the Sick Children's Hospital. I would go along every month and meet with the general nephrologist and put our children on the list for transplantation. Um, transplantation initially was carried out by the general surgeons from the Western and then uh, some years later by the general with general paediatric surgeons. Um, and I think then again went back to the general surgeons in, in the Western. So transplantation was a great development for these children um, and they did well. We, because we were transplanted children from all over Scotland, we benefited greatly from Ronald McDonald House being set up at that time. However, I wanted just to mention two young people, adolescents. First girl uh, was on home hemodialysis, doing quite well, but a transplant became available for her. She went to the Western, had a transplant, functioning very well. But within the first 10 days post-transplant, she died suicidal death. Um, that was one little girl that we were very concerned about, uh, the way that it happened. Another uh, adolescent girl, and we were delighted because she was all worked up. The sister, the sibling, was all worked up to give her a transplant. But the week before the transplant, I got a call from the ward and this sister, due to give the transplant, was in tears. She didn't want to give her kidney. So at that time, David, we realised the importance of the psychosocial input into the programme. And a big psychosocial team were very happy to come along and meet with us very regularly. The, a clinical psychologist, a psychiatric social worker and a psychiatrist. And we had great benefit from them uh, subsequently. Um, and uh, 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 they became, especially the, the psychologists, became quite specialist, helping mm -hmm. patients and families on a one to one basis. So that was a great development. Mid 80s, uh, we, a certain consultant was appointed, and that was a great thing because actually. If I wasn't in Glasgow, we lost occasional child because the general SR that we'd be covering didn't have nephrology background. So that was a big, the second the point of the second consultant was a big advance in the service. Again, uh, later on in the eighties, uh, Mrs. Ward of the British Kidney Patient Association helped us out a lot by uh, funding the reorganisation of the seventh floor ward and that allowed us to bring services on the, on the one ward and that was a big uh, development. So I'm finishing David now with some thoughts, not necessarily wise, but some of my thoughts for the future. I wanted to tell you a story about this young man that we treated over his childhood years. I was on the plane to London and when I got off the plane, this young man ran after me, shouting Dr. Mark, Dr. Mark. He was a small young man, but he had a tall wife and a little baby. And I said, oh, hello. And he introduced his wife. And he told me that he was now a very successful businessman up and down to London. This young man we treated before there was growth hormone when we were struggling with the technical aspects of regular hemodialysis um, and he was transplanted. And I just wanted to say to young paediatric nephrologists and not so young, it's all worthwhile when you meet an ex-patient like that it was an absolute delight to see such a young, fulfilled uh, man. Even though he hadn't grown because no growth hormone, he was full of life. So I just would like to say it's all worthwhile, the commitment, the hard work, the struggle. So keep going. 
Second thing I would like to say, uh, I, I felt from my experience that teamwork is essential, not only within the renal team, but with, that, with other specialty areas. And again, I'm, I, I would say specialist psychology would need, in my opinion, or would I would hope in the future, would be central to any team. The last thing I'd like to say is about that little boy that I was explaining had the barra for his two litres of PD fluid. After we treated the little boy for a couple of years, one day his mother came to me and she said, Dr Murphy, I think we've done enough for Craig. Can we not just let him go now peacefully? So my last word of advice is please listen to families and learn from them. Dr Murphy, thanks very much for those words. <laughs>